Hi, I'm Tracy. I'm an alcoholic. Ooh, I don't know why I'm so nervous today. Like, I've done this quite a few times before, but today I'm like, I'm particularly nervous. Maybe, like, I think I just feel like I've got pressure, you know? Like, 13 years is, is a lucky number for me. And um, I'm, I'm so grateful. I woke up again this morning with my two kids in the bed and my husband, and kind of like my life is completely different now than it was 13 years ago. 13 years ago, I was alone. I had nothing... No one wants anything to do with me, and I'm kind of like, wow, like, how does that happen? How do I get so lucky that I've got a second chance in life, you know? And I kind of feel pressured to, like, share that message. Um, and also, I'm like, how do I put that amount of time in, like, 20 minutes or half an hour? Like, I'm scared I'm going to let, let, like, anything go, but at the end of the day, it's my story and my message, like, I can only say and let God talk through me, I suppose. Um... So how did it all start? <laughs> okay, but there. Yeah. Um, yeah, I grew up to two very loving parents where um, my dad was an alcoholic. Um, so I had a lot of fighting in the house. Like I kind of remember a lot of friction. My first memory is my third birthday and there being a huge fight and my mom running away from my dad. And I kind of always had those, those thoughts. Like those are my earliest memories. Um, and eventually my parents got divorced where I went to go live with my mom and my mom and I were, it was like her and I against the world. We just did everything. My dad wasn't really around at that stage. And, um, my last, one of my last memories was, um, my sixth birthday. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's how I manage all my life is right now. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> so, um, yeah, okay. So, yeah, um, my last memory was of my sixth birthday, and um, my mom the following day took me to school, and um, a Patco bus skipped a red robot, and she died in front of me. And it was really what I remember quite traumatic because I remember someone picking me up and taking me to my gran and I told my gran and then I landed up in a, in a helicopter in a hospital and no one really told me what was going on. Like I kind of knew something was going on, but everyone was so worried about protecting me. Um, and they only told me about a month later, I missed my mom's funeral. I think it was in the eighties and no one really knew what to do with that kind of stuff. Everyone just kind of tried to the best of their ability and tried to protect me as best as they could. But I never really had much of a reality because of that. Um, but everyone did really love me, even though I didn't feel like it at the time. And I kind of, um, they tried to do the, make the best decisions they could. Eventually, my dad married my mom's best friend and she became my stepmom. And they gave me everything they could. I went to a private school. Um, my life was quite happy for quite a while. Everything kind of seemed like it was going okay until they decided to have children. When I was about 13, I had my first stepbrother. And I just remember being so angry and resentful and jealous that this little child got everything that I wanted, which I'd always had. Um, and with that, I went to boarding school because I kind of thought that was the best thing for me. There was also a lot of fighting and a lot of um, stuff going on at home. And financially, we weren't doing really well. Um, so I went to boarding school where my dad had huge expectations of me to become prefect. He was like this is going to be it, this is what you're going to do, because I'd moved around a lot, sorry, <laughs> and um, as soon as I got there, I became the rebel, and I hung out with the people where I felt the most comfortable with, and I got caught smoking all the time, I was in detention all the time, everything that kind of my dad wanted from me, I was completely opposite, um, I didn't like following the rules, I held the record of kitchen duty for the longest, I think 13 weeks or something, because I had a bad attitude as well. And eventually, the one night, I remember having a fight. We had a, a disco at the school or a social. And I remember one of the day boarders bringing in a bottle of tequila. And um, I'd had a fight with one of my girlfriends because she chose her boyfriend over me, and I was devastated. So everyone was starting to have a drink of this, and I didn't even know what it was. I just thought it was a square bottle. But just the feeling, the first time I ever had it, like everything kind of went away. I stopped worrying about my friend that we were fighting with. I stopped worrying about everything. 
And I kept going back. Everyone else had one sip and could kind of dance and be okay. And I just remember, like, that wasn't it. I just felt like I'd found my solution. Until eventually I had too much and I got caught on the day. <laughs> and um, by the head girl, I told her exactly what I thought of her. So that didn't go down very well. <laughs> and um, they took me into the principal's house and I kind of, I sung like a bird because I was under pressure and I was drunk. And after that, I blacked out. Um, I remember waking up tied to my bed with all my jewelry and everything taken away. And um, they told me the next day I wanted, uh, that day that I wanted to kill myself. And so that was my first drunk. And it was always kind of like that for me. Every time I drank after that, uh, it was always unmanageable right from the beginning. Um, so I got expelled from boarding school. They didn't want me there anymore. And my stepmom with my two brothers didn't want me at home anymore either. And I remember my stuff beginning dropped off in black bags to my aunt, who was the only person that would take me in. Um, and I went to go and live. Nev shared the other day, so I was living in the North Rand, no, North, <laughs> and I went to the East Rand, and I was like, oh my word, like life was completely different from me. for me. Things were very different, like the classes were different, like people didn't really have as much money as I was used to, like everything was very, very different. I also remember going from a school where no one smoked to an East Rand, everybody smoked. So it was like, and I was like, whoa, <laughs> I found my people. And um, I kind of felt very isolated though when I got to my aunt, I felt very unloved. I kind of hadn't seen that it was my behavior that had caused a lot of this separation with my dad. And um, the principal told me, listen, we're not going to accept that kind of behavior that you've had at your previous school. If you don't get with a program, you're going to be out and go to some clinic school, I think they were talking about. And all of a sudden, I could kind of conform for a while. And um, I became, I hated school. I used to wish on the way to school, I'd have a car accident again, even though I'd lost my mom in the previous car accident. I really, really hated school. Um, I was just miserable. And in my spare time, I would just sleep. I found like solace in just like being by myself and sleeping. And that kind of brought my first antidepressant. I was 16 and the doctor prescribed it to me to try and kind of get this horrible like feeling that I had. Um, and I kind of yeah, I got through school. I, I failed at a nine because I really hated it and didn't apply myself at all. And um, I went to college. And there I could, there were no rules, well, less rules. And I was like, Ooh, okay, cool. I could have a fringe and a short skirt and I kind of felt okay and I could smoke every time I wanted to. I didn't have all these rules and I kind of excelled quite well at college. I did quite well, except um, drinking started coming more and more. And eventually my aunt, I went to go and live with my dad because there were less rules there. He was a lot better because he was an alcoholic himself, so I could drink whenever I wanted to. But what was kind of happening is every time I was drinking, I was blacking out and kind of going into places like I didn't even really know um, until eventually I went to go and work in a pub, not the best place for someone like me because I kind of got into that routine where I'd work till 10, 11 o'clock, then I'd go drinking until 4, 5 o'clock, and then I would kind of start again until eventually my best friend that I'd met at this place um, – it was obviously an alcoholic like me. <laughs> um, she went out one night and went to a rave and came back and she's like, oh my gosh, I've got the solution. And I was like, oh, okay, cool. Because our money was just disappearing. I was landing up in blackouts all the time. I was landing up in really bad situations. And um, so I went to my first rave and I was like, oh my gosh, I've like really, really finally found my people. Everybody was like, the music was amazing. I took my first drug for the first time. And... Um, I just was like, wow, like everyone was massaging each other, brushing each other's hair. I looked amazing. <laughs> I was like, and I could keep going the whole day and I kind of felt more control because I didn't wake up the next morning and think, oh, what have I done and where have I been? All of a sudden, I kind of knew where I was and I kind of was like, wow. And all I did, knew is I wanted more. And I kind of, that started that cycle for me. Um, every weekend, it kind of just carried on and on and, and got more and more intense. The parties got bigger and wilder. Until eventually I went to a Cole Cox rave and I met my husband. And that was great because he was gay at the time and I was pregnant to a married man's child. And um, I thought this was it. I thought this is my solution. This is going to be amazing. He's going to look after me and we're going to go into the, the, the sunset together. And it was okay for a while. I decided to have an abortion because I was in no way like as soon as I found out I was pregnant I did coke for the first time and I kind of just was no I, I knew I couldn't do this so I kind of went through that and um, my ex and I 
landed up partying for four years and it just got more and more parties. The drugs got worse and worse. But from the outside, everything looked amazing. We had a beautiful house. We had the BMW in the, ba- in the garage. We were maintaining two jobs. I was doing my apprenticeship as a hairdresser and it was kind of looked okay from the outside, but the inside was not okay. And I kind of, eventually we got married and it just got worse and worse. And I remember by the time I was 21, I was um, 21 or 22, I was in a shop and all of a sudden I started getting like really paranoid and I felt like the police were after me. I felt like the security were after me. I was basically went underneath all the clothes and um, I landed up at my first psych, a psychiatrist for the first time. And I kind of told him everything that was going on except for all the using I was doing, <laughs> but the mood swings and not being able to sleep, the up and down and everything. And after five, 10 minutes, she was like, Oh, okay, so you've got bipolar, you've got a borderline personality, you've got all these labels. And I was like, yes, that's exactly. I always knew there was something wrong with me. And now there's definitely something wrong because the psychiatrist told me and kind of put me on all these meds. And that's where the cycle to all the psych ward started. Every, it got closer and closer. Every 18 months, I'd land up back in the psych ward to kind of do my medication, to try and get back on track. But I'd be using the whole time. Um, And eventually, I think after being with my ex for about seven years, I woke up the one morning and thought, this is it. I'm not doing this anymore. He doesn't make me happy. Our diseases had progressed so much that he was more into his recreational drugs. I was more into my pharmacy stuff. And we kind of had no relationship. And I liked his his best friend. So I kind of left. (laughs) And I decided, and I caused a lot of heartbreak and a lot of not understanding and whatever. And I was like, Tracy's wall, and that's what I did. Um, eventually work, I couldn't keep up with the whole thing um, and using and everything. Um, after about being there for about eight years, they were like, they just wanted me to go. And I had nothing really left. I thought Joburg was a problem. I thought everybody else, all the clubs and the dealers and everyone were a problem. So I thought I'm going to come down and move to Belito because my grand and my aunt were here. And I thought I'm going to live the beach life and it's going to be amazing. But what I didn't know is I was bringing myself with me. And within six months, I got a job and a place. And within six months, I lost the job. Um, I wasn't able to go to work anymore. I was blacking out all the time. Um, I was causing a lot of drama everywhere I was. Eventually, I got thrown out of where I stayed. Um, My family didn't want anything to do with me. Um, And I remember going out one night and coming back with some guy that stole my scooter. And... um, just being so like in that place where I just wanted to die. I was like, I don't want to be here anymore. Like, but I was too scared to take my own life because I tried a few times, but I was just like, and I must have cried out for help because straight after that, certain things started happening. Someone bashed down my door and I landed up in hospital for two weeks. They didn't really know how to treat me and they let me out and then they put me back in. And eventually I think my dad was like, something needs to happen. And I got taken to Joburg on a plane And I had my last drink. I didn't know that was going to be my last drink because I would have had a lot more. I had a gin and tonic on the plane. (laughs) If I'd known that, I would have probably been like, woohoo. But anyway, I got to Joburg expecting that I would be able to party and see my friends. And my dad basically locked me in the house and said, tomorrow you're going to rehab again. And I'm like, no, I don't think so. And I took all my pills, hoping I was going to die. And I woke up alive and I was like, oh, this really sucks. And... um, So I landed up at the treatment center that I first went to. I'd been there a couple of times before, but this time I was in the the rehab side, which I kept kicking and screaming and throwing pot plants and cutting off the labels. And like, I was really a nightmare. Um, I was taking on the counselors. I was horrible to the doctors, abusive to the nurses until eventually it was over my birthday. And I remember having my birthday in rehab and I was like, this really sucks. Like it was horrible. And my dad wrote me a letter and he was like, Tracy, I can't watch you. I've lost your mother. Um, I can't watch you killing yourself anymore. Like, you're going to have to either, I'm going to try and help you as much as I can with the program, but you're going to have to get with the program or, like, I can't do this anymore. I'm going, it's going to kill me, but you're going to have to go. And for the first time, I knew my dad was, like, telling the truth. Um, And I saw it in his eyes, and I first tried to fight it, and I kind of knew there was no point. So I complied for a while. Um, and I kind of tried to start listening and I stopped fighting everybody and everything. And I started listening because even at that treatment center, there were meetings every night. And that was where I first got introduced to AA and, and our sister fellowship. And I started hearing things about God and I was like, oh, not for me. I don't do that. 
um, and started like hearing like people being happy a little bit. And then um, I got told, listen, you need long-term treatment. You've been doing this for too long. You've been in the sight wards. This is not going to work for you. And that's kind of where God was already guiding me. My ex-husband had been to the treatment center where they wanted to send me. And they said, look, it's, um, they're amalgamating. It's not a good time. You need to try, maybe try look somewhere else. So my dad started looking on the coast and there was one that was very Christian based. And my dad's like, this is not going to work for Tracy. And then there was the, the one that was up the hill. And um, as it was, was one of the counselors that was working there at the time, Brian, he was going to see his sister in Joburg. So my dad brought him to come and see me. And he came and he, he like, it was the first 12 step call I kind of had. And he explained to me, like, how the program could work for me and um, that how happy he was and that he was also a pull junkie like me. And he kind of, and I just, for the first time, I kind of felt like a little bit of hope, but I also didn't kind of think it worked for me. He also told me I could maybe have to come off meds and I could see the sea from where I was going, like maybe at the top of the building <laughs> on a good day. <laughs> but anyway, I got there. And my dad had to drive, uh, had to fly, and, I, and eventually I got there. But when I when I got to the treatment center, like the happiness I saw, people were playing volleyball, and um, they came, and everyone was happy. Like it just seemed a bit different to me. And I kind of also was told, like, oh, we don't do because I was on antibus, we don't do this here, we don't do that here. And I was like, what? Oh, and the meds, maybe you probably don't even need to be on them. And I was like, uh, uh-uh. uh, the psychiatrist that I've just seen now I've told me for two years I need to be on these meds. There's no chance I'm coming off. And um, I kind of, everyone started telling me their stories and I kind of saw like Andre was on the same kind of meds as I was and I kind of saw that there might be a solution. And maybe, maybe if I was willing to start doing something differently, maybe I would start being happy. And I really wanted to be happy. I hadn't been happy for, I couldn't even remember when last I'd been happy. And I kind of wanted what some other people had and I kind of started listening um, a little bit more. I was still very willful. There was one time when I was detoxing and they wanted me to come out of my bed and I think every counselor came and told me and I was like, mm, not happening today, I'm detoxing. <laughs> Until eventually I was like, okay. And I started listening and um, my step one for me was because I was also in a lot of denial, well, very much denial, that I kind of thought my dad had a problem <laughs> and I shouldn't be there. And when I kind of started seeing how powerless I was and how unmanageable my life was, I was shocked. I was like, oh my God, I am like, wow. My step one took me over a month because I was detoxing and I actually went and redid it on my own volition because I was like, I knew that there was, you know, all of a sudden I knew that there was stuff. And when they kind of started talking about a higher power, I was like, mm -mm, not going to work for me. I don't do that um, because God would have never like let my mom die. Like I grew up without a mom. I grew up with three or four different stepmoms and I had a very difficult life the way I thought. Um, and if there was God in that, like, where was he? But what I didn't see, there was always God in my life. And kind of God brought me to the stage of where I had to kind of see and, and start having a relationship with him. And when I kind of saw, I often share about this, but my sponsor took me outside in treatment and there was a huge tree. And she's like, just look at how everything works. For the first time, I wasn't thinking about myself. And I was like, hey, yeah. Okay, so the grass and the bugs and the moon and the stars and the, and everything and there's a power like that is generating that and she's like maybe try to tap into that and I'm like okay cool so I didn't have to worry about because I was one of those people in coke that I was always fighting everything <laughs> about if and where and what and all of a sudden I was like okay I'll do this like and I kind of and I started getting a relationship with a higher power it was very small in the beginning and then I kind of started it started growing and growing. And the more I started seeing, I remember there was once a meeting I went to in Umkamas where a lot of us in treatments had all been together and we were all around step three and we all started looking different. And that was God. And I was like, oh, wow. Like, I, mean, I couldn't see it in myself, but I could see it in other people. I could see something was working. And that kind of pushed me more towards that. Um, and when I did my step four, I was like broken. Um, when I kind of saw, because I was angry and resentful and I was angry with um, the Patco bus drive, I was angry with my mom and I was angry with God for everything that had happened. And when I kind of looked at it and I, and I did my inventory and I saw that I had a part to play in that every time. And even though it was justified to have that resentment, like I had to like let go and kind of I started praying for the bus driver because I used to be so angry. I used to phone Patco to make sure that this guy was in jail or dead or, or like suffering because I'd suffered. And I started praying for him. I don't know who he is. Still don't know anyone. But I kind of like had to just keep praying for myself. And eventually the resentment went. And kind of had to see where I've always manipulated everything. My mom died. Shame. 
So I got everything I wanted and I had to stop doing that. So my step four was really life-changing for me and it was the biggest change. It was the hardest step I had to do because I had to look at myself for the first time and kind of work through um, my defects. Um, those were not great and I still get them. Like um, <laughs> they just keep coming actually. And God keeps giving me lessons and I kind of keep working through them and, and it's okay. So when I kind of finished my um, treatment, I had been already at uh, the treatment center for over seven months. I didn't think that was possible because I fought for three months and eventually I was like, I didn't want to leave. And they're like, no, it's time to go now. And I was petrified. I was like, oh. I also, when I was doing my inventory, was when it came to fear, I didn't think I feared anything because I'd lived in a bubble for so long and all of a sudden all the meds were gone. And now I'm like, oh, I'm fearful of everything. I remember trying to go out to work while I was in the treatment center and I went out to a place in Toti and I left a lady with foils on her hair and I ran out of the salon and um, I stood at this coffee shop and I had a choice to either go drink and knew that that feeling would disappear immediately or I could pick up the phone and come and call and the treatment center came and got me and, I, and that's what I did and I kind of kept on doing the next right thing I cried for three days in Don's group and saying I can't do this and I'm like oh my gosh I'm a failure and he's like and Keith was saying to me, look, maybe sometimes some people have to take a bit longer than other people. And I was one of them because I'd been on meds for so long. Um, I'd forgotten how to do basic things. And I kind of had to walk through those fears till eventually I left the treatment center. And each day was something new. Some people can do three months, walk out and be okay. For me, it was gradual, gradual, gradual. Like I worked at a the salon down here in Scopra and I used to go run onto the into the toilet get on my knees and say please God can I just like answer the phone today can I just talk to someone because I had to learn all of those basic things again and John also said to me like um, every day write something new like you're going to ask God to to help you with because at one stage I couldn't go to the beach I was too fearful to go to the beach and he's like just ask God just hand it over and go and do it whether you have a good time or not it doesn't matter like just go do it and I kind of landed up doing that every day. Like I, I just did something until eventually after 18 months, the kind of fear gradually went away. Uh, I think I was about 14 months clean when um, Rob, uh, we'd been friends right through treatment, but um, nothing else had kind of happened. And he asked me out one night, one day at a Cuddy Soft meeting. He's like, do you want to go for pizza? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. <laughs> um and I phoned my sponsor, and I'm like, I'm not sure. We've always been friends. I don't know. And he, she's like, just go and just go find out. It was the most awkward pizza we've ever been for. We were both like, ne neither of us knew what to do. We were like, okay. So we'd been friends for so long, and now all of a sudden we didn't know how to talk. We didn't know how to eat. We didn't know how to whatever. And we kind of got through that. Um, and, yeah, we were going to try and take it slow. In a true addict style, we didn't. Like, I think we were living together within, I think, two or three months. And with that came, like, a lot of... Um, I'd never known how to do a, a relationship properly and he had never been able to do a relationship properly so for two years it was hard I remember speaking to my sponsor more than I'd ever spoken to before you know um, and, and trying to work through like different care all of a sudden I was controlling didn't know I was controlling until I was in a relationship listen <laughs> I am very controlling and um, also part of in a relationship I never wanted to be codependent I was I said I've got new dependence I'm going to be so go code uh, so independent and all of a sudden like this disease can be very cunning and baffling and two, about three years later, I was so codependent. I'd lost most of my friends in recovery again. It was all about how I wanted Rob to perceive me. I wanted to be a certain way. I also kind of felt like if I was a certain weight and looked a certain way, he wouldn't leave me and I would be okay. But what I had to learn about is this recovery is an inside job and I had to learn to be okay with myself. And I was never, while I was in treatment, willing to look at my like how my disease had progressed in, in the, the eating stuff and, and, and my, the way I looked and whatever. And I got into a very like dark place because all of a sudden I was alone. Rob had started um, remote control airplaning and I wasn't the, the center of his attention anymore. And I was like, and I just remember being so lonely and I'd stopped smoking at that stage. I used the program to stop smoking and I felt like I put on a lot of weight and um, I didn't know how to control that anymore. And I didn't know how to work my program around this stuff. And I kind of got to a stage where I just wanted to die. And I remember I never ever wanted to use, but I remember going to my sponsor. I was five years clean. And I was like, please tell me what to do because I don't want to live like this anymore. And she's like, okay. 
this is what you need to do. You need to learn to have your own life. And I had a whole lot of stuff that I needed to learn and, and do. And a lot of it didn't make sense to me. A lot of it was against like what I thought. But I was in so much pain, I kind of did it. And I threw myself into a different fellowship. I helped where I could. I kind of had to let go of a whole lot of ideas. Like if I wasn't the size, uh, size 30, it didn't matter. Like I had to be okay with who I am. And because of that, my relationship got better. Everybody else got, you know, I got better and everything was okay again. But um, it was a very dark part of my recovery, but I'm glad because it kind of made me, it was the next uh, thing of the onion for me, you know, and I kind of had to work through that. Am I running out of time? Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> so, um, yeah, eventually then Rob and I got married. And um, again, I was really fearful. I'd been married before and I was like, oh. I don't know if I can do this. What if I'm not marrying type? And I remember going to see Don. Don was, he actually married us. We got married in court. And he was like, it's easy. He's like, you can't promise to, to love somebody for the rest of your life because isn't that old behavior? And I'm like, mm. he's like, but just for today, you can do this. Just for today, whatever you put through your recovery, you can do in your relationship. So commit to just for today. And some days I get it right and some days I don't, like my recovery. Like, um, but I know the more action I put in and the more I do this, the better, I can, the better it is. And I kind of had to be like, I was like, oh, okay, so it's not forever. Like, you know, just for today I can do this. And we got married and we had the most beautiful recovery wedding. Everybody in our wedding was recovery um, from the DJ to Don to like everybody. And it was a beautiful day. Like, um, and that's when the hard work started. No, not really. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> no, it was beautiful. And it was uh, uh, one day at a time. And eventually, I think about a year or two years later, I, um, we had Reeve, which was also like, um, I really missed my mom when I was, uh, like, I, I knew I dealt with, um, with her loss and everything, but it was different, you know, once I, I became a mom myself and I kind of had the fellowship there and I had women and I could ask people and I had my sponsor to try and help me become a mom, like I didn't know her. And we were okay and we kind of said that we were just only ever going to have one child and then, surprise, God had other plans and I fell pregnant with Leia. And... Um, I was devastated because it wasn't part of my plan. I knew that I got very sick when I was pregnant. We, I wasn't on medical aid because I kind of um, thought, oh, well, I'll go on to a different medical aid in January. And now all of a sudden I wasn't on medical aid. We just had enough money to just cope with what we had in our lives. And I thought I couldn't afford that. And um, I had a lot of fear around it. So my first thing was to speak to my dad instead of my sponsor. Bad idea. Because he was like, well, maybe you've had um, a termination before. Maybe this is maybe this is what you and Rob should do. And it kind of sounded like a really good idea. Not, I didn't want to, but it just made perfect sense. Until Rob went and spoke to his sponsor. And I went to speak to my sponsor. And both our sponsors are like, where's God in all of this? Like, God has taken you through every step of, of the way. Like, why is he going to let you go out down now? And I'm like, oh, absolutely true. And I kind of was like, okay. And I just remember that I was just going to go with it. And it wasn't an easy journey. I did get very, very sick. Um, we kind of tried to do it through the government. Um, and I, I really struggled. I even remember spending one night at GJ Cooks and I, it was really, really hard for me and I didn't know like what was going to happen. And I remember my, my sister-in-law phoning me the one day and she's like, how are things going? And I'm like, not good at all. I'm like, I'm really sick. Like, I don't know what's going to happen. And, and she's like, why don't you ask for help? And I was like, because we're trying to do this ourselves because we got ourselves into this mess. And she's like, and she spoke to my in-laws and I remember being, got, I was sent to a different um hospital um and when I got there I'd been so sick when I before I didn't know I was going to make it but we didn't want to take we even to a government hospital so we kind of just tried to get through the morning and I remember them putting a stamp on me and I was like stamp 58 or something and I thought I don't know how I'm going to get through 58 people before they see me and I was swollen and the next thing my sister-in-law phoned and she's like Tracy leave I've sorted everything out you're going to go to a private hospital go back to the doctor you went to and I just started crying because I was like, oh, my God, I just knew God had like a hand in this and everything was going to be OK. And I remember going to my doctor where I'd been with Reeve and they're like, sorry, he can't see. You're going to have to try come back next tomorrow because uh, he's going overseas. You can't see any new patients. And my friend that I was pregnant with at the same time, she'd had an appointment. She was sitting. She came into the appointment. And this lady just freaked out. And she's like, I've been waiting for my appointment for 20 minutes. I can't do this. I'm going to Galleria. 
And the receptionist just looked at me and she's like, okay, can I have the appointment? And I'm like, okay, thank you. And that was just kind of like how God had my back every step of the way. And the doctor was also like, listen, you're going to have to try and keep this baby in as long as possible because to have a cash patient in ICU is so expensive. Like you're going to have to just try. And I was like, oh. And then I remembered while I was meditating that night, that Rob was actually on a hospital plan and Reeve was on hospital plan. So if we had a baby, the baby would be on the hospital plan and we'd be okay. And so that was kind of what happened. And eventually I went to go see the doctor and he's like, he, uh, my, another doctor, he came and looked at me. He's like, this baby has to come out tomorrow. He's like, you're not okay. One of you are not going to make it. Like something serious is going to happen. And I'm like, oh. and I, I remember being so petrified that night. I was alone because Rob had to look after Reeve. And I just like kept on praying and I kept on having this faith. And I like, I didn't know what a 31 week old baby looked like. For me, I thought it was a chicken. Like that was what I had. And Leah was born that day, uh, the next day, and she was the most beautiful child, like this little perfect little being with this dark hair, and she was perfect. The only thing is she was really small. She was one point six, and they had to take her away from me. And I'm like, that is a miracle, you know. And then I had a baby shower, and I we were looked after for like so long. And that's been like my experience in this program. Like if I put this first, the woman in the in um, the fellowship had a roster and cooked for us every night like we didn't have to worry about food I didn't have to worry about Reeve and Rob like I was just looked after and that's been my experience in this fellowship like I've always always been looked after it doesn't matter how big I think something is or how small like as long as I, I put this person hand over to God like like it's okay it might not be how I want it to be and Leia came out yeah after three weeks of NICU of a bill of like I think nearly a million rand like the medical aid paid like everything was just sorted out um, and she had colic and we had to get through that. And But what happened is it brought Rob and I closer, like, because we hadn't really had a bond for a while because we had Reeve and we had to get through this NICU process. And we, we were like, so that's God. Like, I've always, always kind of been looked after. Um, I'm, I'm sure I'm running out of time now. Okay. <laughs> so um, after that, I kind of landed up working. I'd always worked in the salon and I kind of landed up working um, in the treatment center that, that um, was always close to my heart. And I kind of, that was also loads of different growth. I kind of thought I'd walk in there and everything would be okay. And I had to learn different things and kind of, um, it helped so much again with my recovery because I could kind of plug in and kind of like what I, I love about my life at the moment is I kind of am, I'm, I'm able to give back. Like it's not always easy and it's quite of a juggle sometimes. I've got two kids and a husband and, and, and a life like with, I've always felt comfortable with addicts, whether they're using and now everyone's basically in recovery and that's amazing. Like this is where I feel and I'm like so grateful that I've been given a second chance of life and that I've taken it, you know, um, and, you know, not always easy, but when I come out on the other end, it's, it's like, amazing. And, um, yeah, I'm grateful for being able to share. I'm grateful that it's over. <laughs> and, yeah, thanks for being here.